So I'll give you the playbook of if I was starting an AI company, here's how I would do it. How do you decide what companies to either invest in or build with this whole narrative that these AI companies don't have a moat? I think it's wrong. We started a business that is going to do two to three million dollars of free cash flow without raising one cent from anyone else. And it was all using this framework. Hey, welcome to the Next Wave Podcast. My name is Matt Wolf. I'm here with my co-host, Nathan Land, and we've got an excellent show for you today. So in the AI world, you've probably heard a lot that AI businesses have no moat. It's really, really difficult to create a new business in the world of AI when everybody can create similar businesses. Well, on today's show, we've got Greg Eisenberg, and Greg has a completely different idea about how this is all going to play out. In fact, he gave us a step-by-step roadmap a playbook on how you can build a successful business in this current world of AI. So let's go ahead and just dive in with Greg now. Greg Eisenberg, thanks for joining us here today. The dream coming true. This is going to be fun. I mean, right now we're in this this era where AI is sort of taking over all of the news cycles and everything has AI baked into it. Even all the products that don't seem like they need AI have AI baked into them. And you're doing some amazing stuff with AI. So it just, it seems like a good fit for you to be one of our first early guests on this show and and talk about where all of this is headed. The interesting thing about AI is everyone from your barber to Jeff Bezos is interested in AI. Yeah. I recently got a haircut and my barber just kept asking me about different AI tools that He was using, he wanted my feedback on it. And what Nathan and I actually have in common is, I think I tweeted something about AI and he tweeted something about AI. And then within 24 hours, Jeff Bezos both followed us on Twitter. Uh, And then Matt also got followed off of that. Yeah, we're all in an exclusive Jeff Bezos follows (laughs) us club now. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So we we gotta finally message him and actually get him to come on or do something with all of us, so. That's right. So Greg, how do you see the holding company concept? How do you decide what companies to either invest in or build with this whole narrative that these AI companies don't have a moat, knowing that almost any company out there can use some of these existing resources to build the same software you're building? How is the approach to what companies to invest in or build? So there's this narrative that if you're building on top of OpenAI, ChatGPT, you're this wrapper that you have no moat and therefore you haven't built any value. And I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong. Because if you think of ChatGPT and OpenAI, what is it? It's basically an amalgamation of the craziest amount of worldwide data in one place. It's, it's, yeah. it's incredible. It's like a trillion times the uh, Great Library in Alexandria, maybe even more. And I think that uh, what people don't get is, you know, what's another little startup that is a thin wrapper around the world's information. Uh, It's Google. Google doesn't create any of the content. They are a wrapper around the internet, but they point people to pages within the internet. And it's the greatest business model of all time. You know, even today, you know, it's trillion dollar company. If you look at their financial statements, a huge chunk of their business still comes from Google search. I also think that there's this great unbundling of chat GPT that is happening. Now, what unbundling is, there's a great quote, I think Jim Barksdale said it, there's two ways to make money. You're either unbundling or you're bundling. And what that means is, what does unbundling mean? Unbundling means, you know, if you look at Craigslist, Craigslist was a marketplace for everything. You had the ability to post a job that became indeed.com. You had the ability to, you know, find a mate that became, you know, Tinder and, and what Match is doing. Basically, on the internet, you can't really be everything to everyone. So there's going to be a huge opportunity to look at what are the different use cases on the horizontal platforms like ChatGPT and what OpenAI is doing, and basically think about how can I apply a community-first approach, create what you might call as a thin wrapper, but what I call is, this is dope. I don't have to rebuild everything from scratch. And, and just focus on a particular use case. Now, I want to give one quick example to that. I forget the name of the founder, pdf.ai. And when... 
ChatGPT introduced this idea around you can now talk with a PDF, basically. Everyone basically assumed that this guy's quote unquote thin wrapper was going to go to zero. And what he noticed is that revenue actually didn't really go down. A lot more people now knew about ChatGPT. There was news about it. They knew that you can use PDFs. And he had a purpose built business focused on it. So I think you're going to see more of like the PDF AI stories than you are going to see uh, other stories. Yeah, I've always thought the uh, critique on like the thin wrapper thing was kind of bullshit. Like, I don't know, like, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Like, like almost every company on the internet's reliant on something. I mean, at one level or not, I'm mean, like, even everybody's reliant on the internet. You're right. You know, where I think the community approach that you're doing m- makes a lot of sense. It's probably a, a really unique advantage is that with the new AI tools, and especially, let's say, GPT-5 comes out, and it's even way more impressive than GPT-4, we're going to get to a point where you're going to be able to look at a, a, a SaaS website and say, hey, GPT-5, go build that for me. Make my own version yeah. for me. That might be like a year away. And if you have a brand and a community, people who trust you, like you, I think they'll keep doing business with you. Whereas if you're just like a soulless company that doesn't have that, I think you're at a great disadvantage in this next wave. Uh, Yeah, I want to expand on that because I don't think a lot of people are talking about like the marketing community angle to Mm. these products. Yeah. For the longest time, people were saying that energy drinks were actually a saturated market. Mm. And then out of nowhere, what's like the best performing stock of the last 12 months or one of the best is Celsius Holdings. And, you know, it's like a $15 billion company. It's a energy drink that they're, they originally targeted women. Because in their research and insight, they noticed that if you look at like Monster Energy and all these, you know, energy drinks, it was very like male dominated. Now, what's the difference from a formula perspective of a Monster versus like a Bang or whatever? Like probably not that different. Same with beer. You know, what's the difference between, you know, a Miller Lite and a Coors Light? Now, a lot of people listening are going to be like, no, I'm a Miller, I'm a Miller, a, a Miller girl or a Miller guy or I'm yeah. a Coors Light guy. But that's identity playing into it. Yeah. You, you've, in your identity, you're like, I'm that type of person. And I think you're going to see that identity-based consumption model happen with AI startups too. Like, I'm not, I'm a Gemini person. I'm not a ChatGPT person. Hmm. Was it PDF.ai? What, what would yeah. be some like advice you would give to that company is as far as like building a community around it, how do you build a community around a tool that essentially just uh, helps you understand PDFs better? Yeah, well, I think the the issue with PDF.ai is it's niche, not what I call super niche. So step one is your horizontal. You have no niche, your chat GPT. Step two is your niche. You're, you've picked like PDF as your category. Mm. And then step three is micro niche, which is like your PDF for lawyers. Mm. your PDF for accountants. What I would be doing is be focusing on the community piece. If I was him, what are the different communities that need PDFs the most and trying to retrofit it for those people? Because those people, like accountants or lawyers, for example, will have a set of pain points that are going to be different than me or you just because we're, we're different. And also, they just might just trust you more if it's called legal PDF as well, which is like the the beer example. They might just trust you because they like the name, which also is an, a thing that not many people talk about in startups, which yeah. is names actually pay a mat. Uh, and you know this, Nathan, um, <laughs> yeah. Mr. Lore, but hmm. names actually play a bigger role in how people actually connect with products than people like to think. Yeah, totally. I think you're right. Like, especially like in the age of AI, that's going to matter more and more. Like having a name and a brand that people trust so they feel connected to. So they keep going back and doing business with that company versus the random company that just, you know, sprouted up out of nowhere and just copied you with AI. You you bring up a good point around if if everyone could basically press the duplicate button. Yeah. Like, how do we think about building companies in that, in that world? Mm. And it's a, a really good point. I've thought about it a lot. And I think that you know, the good side of it, by the way, is that it's going to be really easy to spin things up. <laughs> yeah. And you, you could see a viral tweet and then be like, wow, this is really cool. And you can be living in like Sri yeah. Lanka and you could be 14 years old and you can press the duplicate button. And then you can like, you know, pay for X blue and you, you show up and you reply <laughs> and you get a million downloads. Like your life could could change overnight. Yeah. 
The downside of the of that coin is that competition is going to 100x. Like the amount of software that's going to be created is going to be 10 to 100x minimum. Yeah. Just like you saw that in content land with tools like TikTok. You know, I was an advisor to TikTok uh, for a few years and it was crazy seeing the amount of content, you know, just, I mean, you see it. I'm sure you've seen played with TikTok. Like there's the amount of content on all these platforms, TikTok, YouTube, yep. you know, Instagram, you give people easier tools to create things, they're going to create things. So that's what's going to happen. I'd love to talk about with you guys. Like, how would you navigate this world where everyone's given the duplicate button? Well, I mean, Greg, that's a, that's a big reason. Like, <laughs> I thought you'd be a great guest on the show, honestly, is because like, I think your approach is right on. Like, you're building a personal brand. I think in the age of AI, that's really important. You're an actual person. People like yeah. you and you can leverage that ac across various companies that you build. So I think that that approach is right on. The community aspect, having people involved in the actual product so they like you and, and, and they feel engaged and actually you adjust the product based on feedback and, and talking with them, uh, I think is huge. And also you've got the innovation agency as well, right? That's another one yep. where like, yeah, in, in this new age, like companies have to be thinking about, oh, I don't just have this one product and people are going to use this same product for 100 years. Somebody may come and copy it and they, and they, you know, I think that I have a better brand, but maybe all of a sudden they're cool. And everybody switches <laughs> over, <laughs> you know, and so you have to be, you have to continue innovating and trying new things. And I, I think the companies that are really going to be the big companies in the next, you know, hundred years are the ones that build innovation into their company and they're constantly innovating and spinning out new projects. I, I run this site called Future Tools, which, you know, it, it curates all of the latest AI tools that, um, that come out. There's a submission form on the site where people submit their tools to me. I review them with a team of a couple extra people and this, the tools that I think are cool make it onto the site. So I'm truly trying to curate now. The problem that I tend to have is that every single day, 13 of the exact same tool pops onto the site, right? Almost every single day, I'm like, this. I, I see a tool that's like, mm. here is your AI copywriter. Use this to write your sales copy for your business. Here's an AI blog writer. Every single day, there's like 11 of those submitted to the point where I can't even tell the difference. And a lot of times it's like a completely different company. But I swear I've seen that site, that UI, that that page before. And so, <laughs> um, you know, from the perspective I'm in where I'm seeing all these tools being submitted to me, it feels like uh, this this AI world has kind of gotten to a place where everybody is just kind of already cloning everything else. Oh, that tool worked. Let's clone it. Somebody else clones it. Somebody else clones it it gets to a point where, you know, the, the, the first movers, the, the, the ones that put out the product first are still the ones that people talk about, but then there's just like a whole bunch of junk that followed behind it. So I do think that being an early mover is important, but then I also think about the, the sort of big incumbents, right? You've got the, the Googles, the Adobe's, the Microsoft's companies like that. And you know, I feel like we might be moving into this world where whenever something works really, really well as a small SaaS company, one of those big companies is either just going to acquire it or build it in and then wipe out pretty much everybody else that was doing that already. I mean, we were talking even before we hit record about uh, the new OpenAI video model. It's like when that gets released to the public in a single day, that's already better than Runway, than Pika, than Animate, Diffusion, all of that stuff. There's already a better option out there. So now, you know, what what do we do with those now? So I'll give I'll give you and, and folks listening the playbook of if I was starting an AI company, here's how I would do it. And I'll use an example that we've done and it has worked. Like I can finally say it's worked. We started a business, an AI powered business that is gonna do two to three million dollars of free cash flow without raising one cent from anyone else. And it was all using this framework. So the business is called boringmarketing.com. We started off as a Twitter account, literally. Anyone could sign up for a Twitter account. It's free, <laughs> more or less. And we called it at boring marketer. Mm -hmm. And we created a character behind this idea around, you know, people talk about boring businesses, but not that many people talk about boring marketing. So you start, step one is you, you build a character. You, st you start with a character that people are going to connect with, or maybe you are that character. Like maybe like for me, like I like being that character, you know, or, or Nathan likes being that character. So we just started like talking about boring ways to grow your internet business. People kept asking us, 
about SEO, SEO, SEO. And then we looked at the market and we realized that there was an opportunity to create AI-assisted tools to do Mm -hmm. SEO. So we started using those AI tools on our own products. That's another benefit of having a holding company. You can basically, you have this portfolio of companies that could dog food your product. The good news of it is we knew that people wanted it because they were telling us that they wanted it. We built this community of about 10,000 people. And then we took that, those AI tools, we wrapped it around a service agency to, to help people implement and create content. And, and people started seeing results. It started driving word of mouth. So now all of a sudden, like fast forward, like that, you know, it hit a seven figure run rate within four or five months. And now it's, it's, it's a really profitable engine. And, and now we're moving towards, like by the time this is out, like boringads.com will be out. No brand is attached to a lot of this. Like is, is, is the, that sort of quick run rate, is it because you sort of had a, a springboard with your own personal brand? Or do you think it's due to the, the merits of the products themselves? Like I'm just going on Boring Marketer right mm-hmm. now, the Twitter account, you know, 100, 200, 300 likes per tweet. And this is boring SEO stuff. Right. Like <laughs> what, what the cool thing about having, you know, one personal brand with a few thousand people, you can kind of like give seed capital, kind of like, you know, social capital to another account and be like, mm. hey, like I just started boring at Boring Marketer. Check it out. Yeah. That gets the first two or three thousand followers. And then from that, you try to get it to a point where it's like, you know, it starts off as a baby and then gets to a toddler and then a child. And then now it's like an adult. So I think how helpful was it for me to be behind it initially? Helpful. But do I think it like, you know, my take on Twitter specifically is anyone can get to 10,000 followers if you just set up tweet notifications and write Mm -hmm. thoughtful replies. (laughs) So you could have done that. You could have started at Boring Marketer. It probably would have taken you four months to get there. Mm -hmm. I was able to do it in four (laughs) days. But I don't think that should be a stopping point for people who want to do something like this. I wanted to talk about like the agency business model. I know that was one of the the notes that yeah. we had, Nathan, that we wanted to dive into. Do like agencies still exist several years down the road? I mean, if if we can, if, you know, chat GPT becomes our, our consultant and we can prompt any website into existence in a year or two from now. I think low to mid-level agencies get commoditized to basically nothing or very yeah. little. So you're right in a world where you just pr- prompt something to create a website or a landing page or, you know, a marketing video, like, of course, you know, that's tough. And I think there's millions of people who work in that space that are, mm-hmm. that's tough. Like it is a tough place to be. Mm-hmm. You know, do I think that, you know, McKinsey's going anywhere or Bain or IDEO or, you know, we have a, an innovation agency where we work with Fortune 500s uh, and, and some fast growing startups with like Jasper AI and people like that. Uh, do I think we're going anywhere on, on the innovation side? Absolutely not. <laughs> P- people forget that you need taste. Yeah. Like taste is going to be the most sought after mm-hmm. uh, skill set for the next, you know, at least 10 years. Whereas, and this is somewhat controversial, I think engineering was the most sought after skill set of the last 10 years. And I, I'm a, I could say that as like, I studied computer science, like I'm a trained mm. engineer, you know? But I think that if you're able to, if you have good taste and you know how to prompt and you know how to come up with, you know, great ideas, I'll give you an example. Like we, we came up with a really big idea for a Fortune 100 company to shift their entire business. If you're the CEO of that company, you're not just going to like prompt an idea generator right. to do that. You're going to want to outsource that thinking to someone that you can trust. And that's where taste comes in, right? Like, the, so I think that yeah, get your taste. On, <laughs> yeah, man. you got another sort of example along the same lines is right. I've got a YouTube channel. Um, all of my thumbnails for my YouTube channel are created with AI. I've got like an AI model with my face trained into it. You know, I I use Midjourney for backgrounds. I actually still have a thumbnail designer on my team. He uses AI for me because he knows what thumbnails look better than I do, right? So he can actually use these tools, Dolly, the Stable Diffusion, Midjourney. And I mean, I can create amazing images with those. He creates really amazing thumbnails, pulls them all together and still has a much better design eye than I have. 
So I still hire somebody to use AI for me to make the thumbnails. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think one thing there, though, is like, you know, a, a lot of grunt work, I think, will be kind of replaced with this. So, right. It's like, like you're, you're the guy who's making the thumbnails. He has great taste. But if it's somebody who is doing something just very repetitive without a lot of thought put into it or, or you know, or requiring taste, a lot of that is going to get automated away. Yeah. And I think in a lot of ways, too, it, you know, what you were saying, it, it sort of levels the playing field as well. So, Yes, there's going to be like non-skilled people that might struggle a little bit, but those people in that sort of middle class realm, they also have these tools at their disposal to sort of take them to the next level. If you want to learn how to code, it's easier than ever right now to learn how to code. If you want to learn how to be really good at graphic design, it's easier than ever to learn how to be really good at graphic design. So I feel like the people that are sort of in that middle, lower end, I know this is like a buzzword, but it sort of democratized the information to mm. to get you there, right? Like now it's a lot easier to go from zero to one with the tools that are available out there. I think those people are at a crossroads. Like they can either see the knowledge and see the tools and be like, I'll get to you later, or they can get their hands dirty. Mm. I'm kind of convinced this stuff's going to get you know, 20 to 50% better every year for the next five years. So that's, that's coming soon that this is going to be able to help you plan out <laughs> your life and like an action plan of, of things you could be doing to make your life better. So I, I think that's going to be such an unlock for so many people. There, there's this sort of narrative going on. We were talking about the, you know, AI video generators, like OpenAI just came out with theirs. And there's this narrative that I just absolutely hate that I see all over Twitter that's like, Oh, it's the end for directors. Oh, it's the end for filmmakers. Look what you can do now. And I, I can't stand that narrative. I don't like the narrative of any time somebody goes on Twitter and makes a blanket statement of this AI is killing this industry. What I feel right now is that it levels the playing field, but it also sort of raises the playing field. It makes everybody that is sort of making videos, making art sort of up level their game because now what used to be something people thought was really good, now anybody can do it. So the people that were good at that now need to up their game and get even better at that thing because pretty much everybody can do the original thing. And so I feel like that is kind of what we're what we're seeing right now, especially with like AI video and AI image creation is just this this leveling the playing field for what used to be considered good, but also raising the bar for what is really amazing now. And I feel like it gives creatives, like the the video creators, the art creators, superpowers, right? Like if you're really, really good at art, and now you have AI at your disposal to make art even better, you're still going to be ahead of the game of the person who just learned AI art. So yeah, let's let's talk about that. So Sora which is the model I think you're, you're talking about, is really interesting because you can essentially prompt it to create, let's just say I wanted to create an animation film. And um, right now, I think it's only up to one minute, one minute of film, but I'm, I'm sure in the future, you'll be get access to 90 minutes. And I wanted to create a film that essentially was like a Disney, a Disney film, but with my own script. Like that is in the realm of possibility in the future. So... If anyone could be a Walt Disney, basically, and you, you, you can make that assumption if you have good ideas, right? If going back to the taste thing, you know, mm. you have good taste and you can write well and you have the skills to do that. Then what is mispriced? The mispriced piece is the distribution. The only place that you can't compete with Disney is in distribution. They're in tens of thousands of movie theaters or hundreds of thousands of movie theaters across the world. They are on Netflix. Like they've done these deals. They're taking out Super Bowl ads, stuff like that, right? So that's where I think that people are mispricing creators and they're mispricing distribution in general. So if I'm listening to this, and, and if I'm me too, like, and I'm you, like the thing to do is two things. One is you build a distribution lane. So you do everything you can to build as much distribution and credibility and trust as possible. And then the other lane is playing is the best way to describe it. Like you play with the tools and you play to learn, but you have to pick. You can't just be like, I'm going to be the video person and the audio person and then the writer person. And then you have to like pick a lane also, right? Like mm. you have to decide like, oh, my dream is to build 
is to be the next Walt Disney, for example. I spent a little bit of time in Hollywood. So for like a, about a year and a half, I was partnered with Barry Osborne. I think, Greg, maybe I told you a little bit about this, yeah. but we, you know, Lore.com originally, the reason I bought the fancy domain <laughs> is because I was, yeah, I was partnered with the producer of Lord of the Rings. I was like, we're going to make this new kind of movie studio together. And it was this crazy dream of mine. And so I got to spend time on uh, the set of Mulan out in New Zealand, you know, a Disney set and got to meet all these crazy people out in Hollywood, New Zealand. And one thing you realize is it's so hard to break into that industry, right? And like, you really have to know people and things like that. And it does feel like with this new technology, like so many more people are going to get discovered because they can, they can show, they can show their concepts to Netflix or whoever, right? Like right now, the people who pitch Netflix, they're coming in with storyboards and things like that and a team. And, and that's a big part of what sells, sells it is like the storyboard and like the concept uh, and the research around it. And before people, you had to have a whole team to do that. And now like somebody who has good taste, they could have those ideas, produce the storyboards or a short video concept. Maybe not, maybe that's not, that's not gonna be the final film, but they can produce a one minute or 90 minute <laughs> video and say, hey, here's not the final film, but here you get the, the gist of it. Here's the gist of this idea I have, help me make it. And I think a lot of people are like Netflix will write checks, like large checks to come in and <laughs> produce those films. And so that's going to be exciting for so many people. So you think that like AI video is the new storyboard instead of making a storyboard? Here's just a yes. mock of the video. I think there's so many opportunities around that. I think I think you're, you're going to see like talent agencies, too, where they'll like, you know, they'll they'll pitch the studios with their talent and like just put our talent's face into the concept. Like, here's how this, you know, this guy that we have, girl, this is how they would look in this role. And then you just show it, you know. There's like so many areas in entertainment that's going to get changed from this. Yeah. I also think that the leverage that you're going to have with the Netflixes of the world is going to be, oh, I've got 50,000 or 100,000 followers. Yeah. And I've already posted this IG clip or whatever. Yeah. And I got 20,000 shares and they're loving it and they're, they're banging on the door and they want more of it. Yeah. So I think that's why I always go back to the distribution piece because like I think that that if everyone has the ability to create essentially these Disney style like levels of films and, and, yeah. and storyboards, like it's going to be, you have to have some point of leverage. Yeah. I mean, when you look at like the, the music industry and even like the, the book industry, right, among authors, when you go to get like a publishing deal for books or if you go to get like a, you know, a music production deal from these these music studios, that's kind of the thing they're looking at these days is how big of a following do you have, right? It's a heck of a lot easier to get a book publishing deal if you have a million subscribers on YouTube and, you know, uh, 1.5 million followers on X. You know, it sounds like that might be the future of video as well. If, if the sort of creation of video is completely democratized and anybody can make them, that's yeah. sort of the, the next level is what sort of distribution do you bring to the table on your existing platforms? That's a, I think that's a really interesting way to, to look at it if I'm interpreting what you're saying, right? Yes. I mean, you saw that a little bit with music, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, even when YouTube came out, like Justin Bieber was a YouTube creator. You know, mm -hmm. we didn't call him that, but he posted videos on YouTube. He was found by Scooter Braun on YouTube. And then he became Justin Bieber, one of the biggest acts in the world, musical acts in the world from YouTube. We don't have that really with, movies, for mm -hmm. example, like the way you become big in movies is you go on a more traditional path. Like you go to USC and study film and then you get an internship at, you know, I, you know, XYZ, you know, I don't even know because I don't know the film <laughs> business, but I know all I know from what I hear is that it's, it's a very linear path and you get like, here's like, you have to like check the boxes. What this does is there's only two boxes to check. Do you know the tools and do you have distribution <laughs> is what I'm saying. Yeah. And you can use the tools to get distribution too is the beautiful thing, right? Like you could be somebody in Quebec or whatever, like in a small town a, who starts producing films or, or AI art or whatever on Twitter and get an audience and, and then go out and try to take the next level and, and actually, you know, partner with some big company to actually make it. Absolutely. I also think this is kind of a, a, diff, a little bit of a different topic, but I, I think there's a huge opportunity to create content for different geographies mm -hmm. um, and languages and cultures. Yes. I'm interested to see how AI plays a role in that. So that like, you're not just lip dubbing different videos, for example, like what if in France, you're wearing like a beret or something. And, you know, in Amer and, and, and then the video in the US, maybe you're not wearing a beret, right? You're, you're wearing a baseball cap or something like that. 
just like what are these little nuances things that you can add to the content so that it feels more oh this is for me this is for people like me and i think that's really interesting and i think that the greater trend to that is all media will be personalized i think that's the really cool part about where we are in like the cycle and the this ai world it's like it's not just an ai world it's like there's a lot of mac massive trends happening right now like ai mm. uh virtual reality yeah robotics yeah. is just starting as well and so, yeah. robotics is just starting i saw yeah. um, yc came out with their like here's the things that we're really interested in. i don't know if you saw that yeah i saw it yesterday mm-hmm. yeah it's like you know applying machine learning to robotics using machine learning to stimulate the physical world new defense technology bring manufacturing back to america new space companies climate tech yeah, commercial open source companies, spatial computing, new enterprise resource planning software, developer tools inspired by existing internal tools, explainable L- AI, LLMs for manual back office processes and legacy enterprises, AI to build enterprise software, stablecoin finance, a way to end cancer, foundation models for b- biological systems, the managed service organization model for healthcare, eliminating middlemen in healthcare, better enterprise guru, and finally small fine-tuned models as an alternative to giant generic ones. There's a lot of stuff going on. And, and, and people were saying that part of that whole list was, oh, well, you know, it's an end of the trend with uh, SaaS or something like this. I, I, I think YC is like seeing the writing on the wall. They're like, dramatic changes are coming, like dramatic mm-hmm. changes. And so, yeah, we should be looking for more moonshots, big things, and, and, and it, now the technology is making it possible. But also from a, you know, probably from their perspective, from a, in, in be, investment stand, uh, standing, uh, like the companies that they would have invested in before, a lot of those now probably could be built with like one or two people and they're not going to need as much capital, you know, and, and Greg, you talk a lot about this kind of stuff. But so I think they're looking like, okay, yeah, you, the, the investors and VCs are probably going to focus more and more on the companies that are really going to need a lot of capital. Right. Yeah. People that are trying to solve cancer, people are trying to build robotics and things like this and like new type, you know, simulating the world with AI, like, like very ambitious things that are going to require lots of capital. Because the other one's just like, God, like in a year or two, and especially, you know, I've been hearing from friends in San Francisco, and a lot of them are like connected to the whole YC kind of network, really positive things about GPT-5. I assume, you know, since, you know, Sam Altman's connection to YC, a lot of those people know <laughs> ideas of what's coming. And so they're probably realizing like, yeah, in a year or two from now, a lot of those simple SaaS tools, if you don't have great distribution or a, a brand, they're not going to make a whole lot of sense. And so I think that's part of the list too, is, is that. Like personally, I'm happy that people are working on those hard problems, but I personally prefer working on easy problems. The one to N or, or whatever versus zero to one. Yeah, yeah. I think it's like, I'm a thin wrapper guy. You know? <laughs> and I've, I've, I'm, I did the whole Silicon Valley thing. I lived nine years there. I've been a part of companies that have raised billions of dollars. Like I could say I did it, but man, am I glad to be on the other side? <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and 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 creating thin wrappers with deep communities like that should be the title of this this <laughs> something like that. It's like thin wrappers and deep communities. Like that's the strategy for you want to win in AI. Like that's literally the strategy. But before we do wrap up, I do want to ask about uh, you. Probably need a robot. Could you quickly explain yeah. that to me? Because I was asking Nathan about it and. You know, I figure the the best person to ask about it and get the explanation from is from Greg himself. So can you tell me a little bit about what that is? I start all businesses with this framework of mine. We call it the ACP funnel, audience community product. So like I was talking about with Boring Marketing, we started with the Twitter account. We did the same thing with you probably need a robot. This is like over a year ago. Yeah, over a year ago. AI obviously wasn't as big as what it is today. And... We created a Twitter account where we just share productivity tips with like, we use this tool and here's what we learned. And then we opened up a Discord. And then we got like 20,000 people (laughs) to join the Discord, Uh, maybe more, 25,000. And we saw that there was demand. And then we, of those people, we turned it into a newsletter. And then every week we would give people like deep dives around, here's how we're using AI this week. So less, not, not like, AI news or anything like that, mm-hmm. but just like, here's, here's things that we're learning and to make it more productive in your business career. And it's, it's evolved to other things too. Like we, we created like a deal pass, which is very popular where you get access. It's like 
48 bucks. Mm -hmm. And like you get, you know, discounts on like all the major AI tools or a lot of them, like My Mind and Drippy AI, Framer and Barely.ai, Apollo. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things like that. And so we've been able to monetize really well through this like audience community product. Mm-hmm. And then we also, you know, because we run a lot of agencies, we also do helping companies like transform their businesses to be AI first. The, the reason I wanted to, sh- yeah, I just wanted to share that structure because I think that that same structure, ACP, could be helpful for other people. Nathan, any, anything else you want to you wanna ask or add before we, we wrap this up? So yeah, I, I really appreciate you coming here and it's, it's been awesome. Thank you for your time and I'm excited to see where this goes and you, you, you're doing great. Appreciate it. <laughs>